Hey, good morning. Uh, this is uh, operating systems. Um, now, uh, this is the uh, agenda for today. Uh, we'll first talk about the prerequisites uh, for this course, cover a little bit of a, a historical perspective, uh, and go over administrative issues, including the materials, uh, our approach, uh, the schedule. Um, and at the end of uh, this hour, uh, the last 15 minutes, we'll be giving a prerequisite quiz. Uh, it's the same uh, in my course and Professor Jerry Cho's uh, course as well. Uh, same time, same quiz, so there's no escape. You have to uh, take it, even if you're enrolled. Um, and the reason is we want to make sure you have the proper prerequisites. Um, so you'll see. Uh, you, so prerequisites, what are they? First, you should have already taken uh, a hardware uh, course, uh, actually more of a computer architecture course, which should come after a digital design course. You should have some ideas about input-output uh, interrupts, but you might not have uh, written code on interrupts, but that's okay. We will give you that chance uh, to write some interrupt uh, code. Uh, you should have taken a number of software courses um, and, uh, well, assembly programming, you may or may not have done, but we expect you to have seen it in your computer architecture course. You should know what a register is, what a stack is, um, or at least have some idea, um, specifically how a language like C uses uh, stacks and maybe heaps, and how it uh, manages its memory in different ways. Uh, C programming is very important. Uh, in fact, if you don't know C programming, you probably can't survive this course. Uh, so you better know C beyond just an introductory hello world type of uh, C. You should know enough. Uh, uh, you should be very, very comfortable with pointers. Um, recursion, OK, I let that slide, but uh, recursion is not that hard. Uh, you should know the ways C calls things. and. Um, and we'll give you a few more advanced uh, C constructs. So by the end of this course, you'll be really good um, C programmer. Uh, you certainly should know fundamental data structures. You should know what an array is. Who doesn't know what an array is? <laughs> if you don't, don't come, don't take this course. Stack. Anybody who doesn't know what a stack is, um, you should <laughs> know. Okay. Uh, and linked list. Anybody who does not know a linked list, you should go back and take your data structures course before trying this. And trees, well, trees you can probably figure out, but uh, but at least know how to do this in um, um, some data structures course. And um, well, so for data structure stuff, yes, you'll use some in C, but we actually want you to have more of the concept. So in fact, we'll be using um, a higher level language, specifically Python. Uh, you might say Python and OS, do they mix? Well, yes, because you think about it, the OS has two parts. One part is really dealing with the hardware, right? That instruction set, the assembly. Anything above that, well, it's all software. So, so I'm actually trying to give you an easier time by focusing on those data structure manipulation. And in Python, you can't be any, it can't be any easier than just doing things in Python. So, um, and uh, so more the algorithm data structure part um, I want you to do in Python. But I didn't list it as a prerequisite because I expect you to be able to pick up Python in one afternoon. Okay, um, it's simple enough. You know C, Python is really easy. So C, specifically, you got to know scoping, right? What's a global variable? What's a static variable? What's an auto local? What's a static local, right? These should make perfect sense for you. Certainly should know what a pointer is, pointer arithmetic, you know what a, how to dereference a pointer, um, that you should know C is zero-based uh, index, right? And, um, and strings and um, arrays, uh, they're more or less interchangeable. Structs, okay, I'll let that slide. Uh, but you should certainly know a function uh, that you can actually pass a pointer to a function. Uh, and do pointer arithmetic. You should be comfortable with memory allocation, like uh, um, what 
the stack does for you automatically. So it's a push and pop, or what the heap does for you. It's, uh, you can do things like malloc and free. Uh, and bit manipulation, you have to be very, very comfortable. You should be able to dream in bit manipulation. The and, or, xor, not, right? Um, if you don't, uh, <laughs> you shouldn't take this course. Yeah, yeah bit man manipulation, that's uh, crucial. Uh, okay, and you should also have concept of how things work underneath. So, what's a compiler? What does it do? Well, a compiler translates high-level language program to assembly, but um, it's not machine code yet. That's what a linker does. Right? Well, assembler translates it into binary, but then linker assigns the addresses and all that. You should have a pretty good idea. Right? Um, and also that you don't write all the code yourself. You actually make library calls. So you do linking of uh, library and also the concept of system calls, although that's part of what we'll cover. Stack, right? Um, a stack is not just a data structure you use and declare a stack type. No, the system has a stack, a runtime stack, a call, a call stack used by C programming uh, language. And um, it, how do you pass parameters? What well, you put on the stack? How do you return from a f function call, subroutine call? Well, you take it from the stack. That's how you can support multiple levels of calls, including recursion. And that structure on the stack is called a stack frame or activation record. Right? You should have some idea of how that works, because if you don't, you can't write an OS um, um, of, of a service like that. Okay? And who's supposed to save registers? Right? If you don't know what a register is, you don't know what to save. So that, again, that's kind of important. And you should be comfortable with uh, Unix tools. Uh, you should be very comfortable working in command line interface, not just IDE, not just a uh, graphical user interface with syntax highlighting. You should be able to write code without syntax highlighting um, and use Vim or Emacs or whichever, right? preferably. Um, and you should know the, all the Unix commands, ls, move, rename, right? rmdir, right? all those. Um, in addition to knowing what a compiler, linker, debugger, editor, make file, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll give you some make files to use, but you should be able to make modifications to make files. Version control, that, well, you do it on your own. If you have, uh, we, we use Git, but if you use SVN or some other thing, okay, more power to you, but um, Git is okay. Uh, scripting language can help, well, I mean, we don't require one, but we ask you to be able to uh, learn it quickly. Uh, data structures, certainly I mentioned those. Arrays, linked lists, stacks, queues, trees, hash tables. If any one of those words don't make any sense, please don't take this course. Uh, computer architecture, yeah. Um, so, I mean, they teach computer architecture here, right? Um, and so it's, you, they used to teach like MIPS architecture, now it's part of RISC-V or something. Uh, or if you know uh, any one of those, that, that's probably good. Uh, so you should know what an instruction set architecture is. Uh, and so that basically defines an assembly language, right? The commands called instructions. And an instruction has opcodes, operands. Uh, so opcodes is kind of like the function, except it's a hardware function. Operand is kind of like the parameters you pass, uh, and then they could be in the form of registers, and they could be what's called immediates, right? So uh, values directly in the stream of uh, instructions. Assembly language, what, what's an assembly language versus a machine language, right? You should know the difference. What's a machine code? Um, and you should have a good idea of the memory hierarchy. What's a cache? What's a main memory? What's a disk? Right? And, and the words uh, stack and heap in different contexts. Right? So uh, computer architectures do support hardware stack, uh, and some support for heap, uh, and other support for programming languages. Right? And you should have heard um, of things like 
interrupts, uh, traps, maybe, maybe not. Okay, traps is a way to make a system call. We'll cover that. So if you don't know trap, that's okay. We'll cover that. Uh, you certainly should know what input output means. And you'll get to do some input and output. Okay, okay so uh, the, the, that's prerequisite part and um, no sense studying now because if you try to cram all that in the next th half hour, you're not going to be able to make a difference. Uh, so, uh, but then you'll find out in another half hour or so. Okay, so what I'll do is to uh, give an overview of OS, different kinds of OSs, the problems they solve, uh, the different components of an OS, uh, different ways of, of metrics for evaluating an OS, and uh, recent trends. So the word OS uh, actually changes its meaning over time. And so what you know of as OS today is very different from what OS was uh, originally defined. And, uh, and this course uh, tries to take a more comprehensive view, but then will stick to the more the fundamentals. Okay? So, well, um, I mean, so to you, OS might be things you have heard of, like Windows, probably the first thing that comes to mind. Windows 10, before that was Windows 8.18, Windows 7, Windows Vista, and then XP, and then before then was what, 2000, and NT, Windows ME, uh, Windows 98, 95, 3.1, and right, so it goes. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, uh, there's Apple, um, but Apple, even they changed a lot. So they had the original Mac OS with a capital M, um, and now this lowercase Mac OS is actually OS 10 with the X, um, and the iOS, watch OS, TV OS, and a bunch of uh, car OS, right? Um, and of course, you, you should have heard of uh, GNU Linux, or maybe just Linux, but uh, some people insist on GNU in front of Linux and GNU slash. Right? And so there's different distributions you may have used, Red Hat, Ubuntu, Debian, and so forth, right? Uh, and of course, a lot of you have smartphones, um, Android probably, and then there's different like candy or cake or snack names for different versions of Android. Right. So to you, that's probably what an OS is. Well, these tend to be um, a lot of things wrapped around the core of an OS. Okay. And they, and um, so what this course is, uh, is going to cover is probably more of the core inside uh, and the principles of the cores. Uh, whereas the other ones, um, uh, the, the outside part, it's arguable what you really consider an OS uh, or not. Right? And you may or may not have heard of these other uh, OSs that have come and gone. So, but some of them have been very important. So uh, like Sun, Sun Microsystems, certainly has done uh, uh, a lot of um, groundbreaking work uh, for advancing the state of uh, computers, uh, both in hardware and uh, OS. And they have a very uh, stable, rock solid uh, version called Solaris. And in fact, you may be able to even get it in open source. Uh, DEC, DEC, anybody heard of this company? <laughs> Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, they have all also been a very influential player. Uh, we're not a business. Um, they. Uh, did something called VMS. Uh, uh, VMS was the OS. VAX was the machine. Uh, so VAX VMS, and that was uh, an, a very important OS as well. Um, and that ran on what is called a mini computer. You say, well, oh, mini computer, it must be small, right? No. Um, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, a mini computer was something of a refrigerator size. Um, and that was mini because that was compared to a mainframe. Mainframe was huge, right? it takes up the entire room. <laughs> so, um, so it's all relative. So they shrank a big computer down to smaller and, and they actually made a lot of uh, innovation along the way. Uh, Alteryx, uh, 
was also another OS uh, by Digital. Uh, AIX was uh, IBM's effort to do a, uh, a Unix-like. So these are mostly, well, VMS is not Unix, uh, but Altrix is certainly one that's Unix-like. And Sun, their OS is all Unix-like. Um, and Unix, of course, was originally done at uh, AT&T Bell Labs. Uh, but because of uh, their proprietary um, s software, the people made clones of those. Um, anyway, and then, so the workstations, so the first uh, category was all workstations. So those were shrunk down uh, computers that you could actually put in the room or maybe even on your desk. But they were bigger than a personal computer. Now, personal computers in the early days were really more like toys. Um, so CPM was one uh, that uh, was pretty popular, was all text-based. Uh, Apple uh, II uh, had what they call Apple DOS. Atari also had their PC DOS. What's a DOS? DOS is Disk Operating System. And in those days, you have you know, a um, couple hundred kilobytes of memory. Main memory, kilobytes, okay? Not, uh, not megabytes, not gigabytes, <laughs> kilobytes. That's not a lot. Um, so to you, this may look like a uh, just a toy, not nothing much more than a calculator. Um, but uh, in those days, well, <laughs> you, you, they make really good use of memory, and you get to do some of that in this course too. And you'll be amazed how much you can do with just a little bit of memory when you have full control. So early ones were all text-based. Uh, so the screen was all text. Uh, in other words. Uh, black background and the letter could be green or gray and they're in fixed positions they don't draw pictures they have fixed locations for these uh, symbols and then you know in the 80s 90s graphical user interface became more popular right so um, it was um, Xerox Park in, in their lab and an Apple um, licensed and Xerox technology developed their own first with Lisa uh, and then with Mac and then at the same time Bill Gates tried to copy the same thing and wasn't successful until Windows 3.1 was okay that was probably usable Windows 95 was when they started taking off but even before then IBM had something called OS 2 and that was Windows compatible and rock solid very uh, um, um, robust, you can't crash it, unlike Windows early days, every hour you get a blue screen. OS 2, very solid, memory protection, you can do drag and drop, right? That, that was back in the late 80s that you could do drag and drop, a picture to uh, something, right? And IBM uh, partnered up with uh, Microsoft, but then Microsoft, with um, their marketing strategy, kind of wedged the OS 2 out of the the market and made certain things incompatible so people say hey it always doesn't work with uh, this or that and then so people just, just I mean based on rumors they just, just shy away from OSU which is kind of a shame OSU was actually a really good OS and then BOS you may or may not have heard of that was um, uh, done uh, the, the, their logo was that ball the checkerboard uh, red checkerboard uh, ball and they uh, wrote it uh, and was really responsive. So they, they had their own hardware and software, but it was already a little too late. Um, and yeah, But a lot of people liked it. And you can still find uh, some um, emulators uh, for it. Amiga OS, uh, similar, right? Uh, in, in that day, they, good technology, but I suppose uh, marketing didn't, to do them enough justice, so they kind of faded away. And the earlier versions of Windows, yeah. Um, so 3.1 was around 1991 or so. And I mean, if you've seen screenshots, it's like, wow, well, horror story. How could you even live with uh, anything like that? But at the time, it was uh, considered to be um, state of the art. Well, I mean, not as pretty as Mac, but um, it was. Uh, a lot better because your alternative was just text-based, right? And so you could use mouse, you could use uh, Windows, so that was um, um, good. And then 95, Microsoft did a big show uh, and invited famous people to a concert and it was a, a big media event. 
Ninety-A was uh, kind of a transition, and Windows Me ME that's Millennium uh, Millennium, so around year two thousand, that was uh, not very good. But NT uh, was a parallel development to all those, and NT was supposed to be for workstation, so they teamed up with uh, Digital, um, who did the, uh, the VMS at the time. Uh, and then digital at the time had this machine called Alpha, which was so much faster than anything else on the market. And so they were trying to target that. Uh, but again, Microsoft did the same trick they did with IBM. Um, so yeah, we'll work with you, yeah, yeah. And then after that, no, they kicked you out. Um, so they, but they kept that technology and then put it into Windows, uh, what do they call it, uh, XP. So. Now, you, sometimes when you format a drive, they ask you, do you want to format an NTFS, right? That's where it came from. So, anyway, and then mobiles kind of started taking off in the late 90s because um, more uh, laptops and things. Well, so mid-90s. Mid so Palm OS came after Newton. Newton was actually around 1994. I actually had one of the earliest Newtons. Uh, it, it basically, it's a... Uh, handheld computer with a pen you can write on um, and then Palm was a much simpler version than that uh, used the same processor as um, like uh, 68,000 uh, 6030 actually but they could do it because these chip makers started um, designing chips that can uh, process uh, um, or can handle power management so you can have a display that's on, but it's not drawing much power because it's figured out how to optimize for that. And Palm was popular for a while and then um, went away. Uh, Windows CE was uh, early 2000. Well, it was uh, yeah, the, yeah, around that time. They wanted to get into um, handheld as well, but uh, it was really not a full-hearted enough job so you had to use a stylus tap and it worked just like a test desktop windows except that takes up most of your uh, screen <laughs> and that's not very convenient too many taps to get into things anyway so these came in went right? so what is an OS well really it's runtime support think of it that way uh, it's above hardware below application software so that's what uh, OS is supposed to be. But um, some people say, well, uh, what about any library code that you link in? Is that OS? Well, maybe not. So OS is really a structure. Think of it as a stable structure. Okay. Uh, so if you just have a library, then that kind of goes with the, the program code, program image, then that's not a stable structure. Right? Because every time you recompile something, then that changes. Right? That's not a stable structure. So it should be a stable structure that's above hardware, below application software. So that you can write, develop your application to that same OS uh, and have a much easier time to do it than if you didn't have the OS. Okay? So think of it as supporting user-friendly programming. Okay? Not just user-friendly as an end user. Of think of it as uh, a programmer, but of course this notion gets extended to being user friendly for the end user as well. And so it can be very small or it can be very big, and it can manage a little bit or manage a lot. Right? So what are the things it can manage? Uh, so execution of the program, including scheduling, including concurrency. I mean, you have a processor, uh, and let's not even think about multi-core. Let's think of this single processor but you want to be able to do multiple things concurrently, not necessarily in parallel, concurrent. That means they go on, at least with the illusion of going on at the same time, right? Uh, so that's concurrency. And, but you, when you write a program, it's hard to write uh, things that's uh, concurrent. So uh, how do you provide that abstraction? Well, that's a job of OS or maybe a threads package. Now, memory usage certainly is one that programmers will appreciate because if you have to redo a memory uh, allocation uh, thing every time, that's, uh, that's a lot of work. Um, and I mean, you can do it, and you can do it in the form of a library, but 
a lot of times this extends beyond just main memory. You can go to uh, virtual memory as well, or memory sharing. Now, de definitely uh, data storage, right? uh, whether it's a disk, flash, memory card, USB stick, uh, or input-output like network, you certainly want to not have to reinvent the thing. You want the system to be able to support these standard uh, features or things like keyboard, mouse, touch screen, audio, video, right, depending on your system, um, so that different programs can all take advantage of these features without having to reinvent them, right? And, and having a stable structure is good. And OS uh, also provide protection and security. So overall, th these are the typical kind of things an OS does. And because it controls so many things, uh, it has value. It has commercial value as well, not just convenience for the programmer. So um, Bill Gates became the richest person on earth, well, till recently, uh, because of Microsoft Windows. Okay? Um, and controlling the OS, initially, uh, IBM didn't think OS was worth anything, right? Selling hardware was where the money was. Well. But OS, initially, they even allow people to pirate the OS. But once they start using it, they depend on it. When Once they depend on it, they can't do, live without it, or they can't operate without it, right? And then they keep upgrading, upgrading, and at some point, you can't just keep using pirated copy anymore. You, you are forced to surrender to Bill Gates, and then so he collects uh, this OS tax, so to speak. And... Um, you know, iOS, uh, which was derived from Mac OS 10, which was from Next Step, uh, which had its roots in uh, mock kernel from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, also made uh, Apple um, uh, make a comeback from near bankruptcy around 1997 to one of the, well, I mean, probably the biggest company uh, uh, in the world. Um, and really it was, uh, I mean, of course, no other hardware also counts, but it's really the OS that's the enabler. And Google, um, of course, you know, saw that. So after they saw uh, uh, iOS, they said, we got to have our own. And so they bought Android, uh, turned it around. Android was actually more for a keyboard type of mobile device. And they completely turned it around. Uh, uh, by copying a lot of the uh, uh, iOS uh, graphical user interface features as much as they could and then gave it away. And now they have the widest use, not only smartphones, but a lot of these like TVs and um, other OSs. So when you think of a computer, a lot of people think hardware. Well, no, it's really the software that uh, allow that, that's that middleman, so to speak, right? Um, and that defines what really the computer is. Um, and because a programmer, when they program, they often don't control the hardware directly. It's too painful, too too much work. And having that OS makes it so much nicer. And you really wouldn't want to uh, do it a lot of times any other way, except if you're doing embedded systems. Yes, you touch the hardware directly. But even embedded systems uh, are starting to um, move towards uh, having some OS. Um, so yeah, the, having an OS uh, does make the programmer's life a lot easier. And that's what you get to um, learn uh, in this course. And it provides a lot of these uh, services. So it's not just hardware. It's uh, uh, software concepts too. Your graphical user interface. Suppose you're having to invent the window touch interface every time you write an application. That's too much work, too painful, right? Uh, but having an OS that supports it makes it so much nicer, right? And you can put together something very quickly. Okay, so now um, I talked about different computer systems, but they're usually divided into what's called general purpose versus embedded. Um, general purpose would be things where you can load on, uh, load up different applications to run. Um, so, like, 
you can write programs to it and run can or in case of mobile you can download apps and then if you don't like it delete it and put a new app there right so that's uh, more general purpose so PCs tablets smartphone server even some TVs right embedders are more dedicated purpose so sometimes you don't even think of them as real computers so like a music player maybe your DVD blu-ray player your TV for example might even be a whole computer in there you don't think of it as a computer a washing machine toaster elevator right um, even this microphone could be an embedded computer right um, and it, what makes it a computer is it has a processor and you write software for it but for embedded system it's often called firmware and it's more specialized so having an OS might not be so crucial since you want to optimize for good resource usage um, and efficiency so you tend to touch the hardware directly and always kind of sometimes gets in the way but um, that's also sl slowly changing and there uh, are a lot more embedded processors than you might realize and a lot of them in the form of Internet of Things you may have heard of IOT so like a car like Tesla um, has easily 65 processors controlling everything uh, from your climate, your radio entertainment system, audio, these um, autopilot cameras, uh, anti-lock brakes, GPS, um, charger, two controlling charger, right? satellite radio, uh, even wiper control, right? that, that's an embedded processor. So some of you might not think of these as very difficult, but some can be pretty sophisticated too. Um, and so these different processors, they might run, I mean embedded systems, could be in a mobile OS, could be a real-time OS, uh, and real-time OS may or may not have a user interface, right? Um, and could be something vendor specific, where it's just buttons and buzzers, no screen, no display. Or something maybe on your wristband, or, or like if there's one in this microphone, there's just a light in some switch, right? Some may have no OS at all, um, and it's just application code driver. Um, and so what they do is they just link uh, a library. So question is, do you really need an OS? Well, for embedded, maybe not so essential. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of times you do want to touch the hardware directly to optimize, but then that makes your code difficult to maintain. So some library at least is important, but library is not necessarily a stable structure. Uh, but slowly, you know, there is a trend towards uh, some kind of embedded OS. Um, so yeah, it's really the debate between language support, language versus uh, library support, and uh, versus uh, an OS. Okay. Uh, OS, really the value is it has, has that nice structure, so it's stable, uh, and your code is more maintainable. Okay? And that, and that uh, can make a big difference. And sometimes even um, determinism, right? Uh, it's a question. So handcrafted code may give you determinism, hard to say. Uh, and overhead, certainly, it, it, when the process are doing nothing, at least as far as the application is concerned, is the OS doing anything? That's overhead, right? And it's hard for a processor to do nothing, um, at least till uh, these sleep instructions get invented. Uh, otherwise, they they really have to be doing something, even if it's just no op. Right? So for this course, we'll touch on uh, concurrency. In fact, we do we'll do a project that will allow you to uh, support concurrency. Uh, in the form of a threads package, and you'll study concurrency in terms of uh, race condition, deadlocks, and uh, others. So th that's uh, really a, one of the core topics in OSs. Uh, resource management, that's a more general concept, including arbitration, maybe some virtualization. We probably won't cover virtualization that much. Um, system design, uh, so abstraction, that, that's uh, basically a structure uh, that hides the ugly side of things. Um, versus monolith, that means you don't have that structure. You put everything all in one mush. Uh, you may have better efficiency with monolith, but then 
you don't have that structure, which makes your code much harder to maintain. Uh, one other concept you've got to know is policy versus a mechanism. Uh, and we'll I'll talk about that in performance analysis. Okay, at this point, I am going to uh, give out that uh, prerequisite quiz.